welcome. And we're glad you're joining us this morning. Whether you're in the United States, Canada, or Alaska, we're glad you're here. We just kind of wish we could reach out and hug you. So you just hug whoever's close and tell them it's from the fellowship and we're all hugging one another. Pastor Jim and Sarah have returned and Blue is happy. Welcome home, Pastor and Sarah. We trust you had a great time and uh, we trust you are feeling refreshed and, and, and uh, feeling well. I want to thank John Chilcote for a great job of training session at Community Connect yesterday. Had a great time together with about 20 people going through the session. Good job, John. We thank you for it. Next Sunday, March 7th, will be Communion Sunday. We'll be holding communion, vir communion virtually. If you need supplies, please call Dorothy Newburn, Sherry Kennard, Tom Burdo, or Betty Hall. Also, next Sunday the 7th, we'll end the baby bottle drive for Choice Pregnancy Center. Uh, so please bring your bottles either here or to Dorothy, or to Dorothy at the office or to Roberta Smith. I want to thank you for your faithful giving. I was reminded this week of the importance of giving and that sometimes a little makes a big difference. Maddie was six years old in Chicago, Illinois, attending Sunday school and the classes were crowded. And one day, the senior pastor asked her class what they thought of Sunday school. And little Maddie said, we're awfully crowded. It'd be nice if we had more room. And the senior pastor said, we'd love to have more room, but we need money to build. And so little Maddie took that to heart. Two years later, at eight years old, little Maddie died. And after her death, her mother was going through some of her stuff, and she found a little bag with 57 cents in it and a note that said to help build new rooms for school. She took it to the pastor, and the pastor took that 57 cents, asking God what to do with it, and he felt impressed to sell those 57 pennies for whatever he get for them. He didn't get 57 pennies. He got over $3,000 for 57 cents. He took that 3000 and re-sold it. And ultimately, 30 years later, they had built a new sanctuary, education wing, a school, and a hospital. All because a little girl did what she could. We thank you for doing what you can, and we know with God all things are possible. You see, the things we go through in life are ultimately for our good and for God's glory. Sometimes we do not see it. We see the obstacles, we see the bumps in the road, but if we stop and look back, we can see the good that God had planned and the purpose for what we went through. This morning we want to just pause and look to the Lord in prayer as we open the service and pray for needs of our family. So would you bow your hearts with mine? And Father, we just ask you to have your way in this service. Father, might lives be touched from your word and might people feel and sense your presence across this nation and around the world. We pray for our nation God, you were, your tells us to pray for those who are in authority over us. We pray, God, that you would bring a sense of power and presence in hearts and lives. Pray for Israel, Lord, that you would bring peace to Israel. God, in the midst of chaos, bring peace. And Father, we pray for those of the fellowship who have needs. We pray for Carol Blackater for Pat Anderson, for Deanna and Jack Bleachman, for Maria Hybeck, for those who are facing surgery in the near future. Lord, we pray for healing, and we pray for the defeat of COVID-19. And Father, we pray for Michael Amberg, 
God, he needs a miracle. And Lord, you are the miracle-working God. And we pray that you would reach forth your hand and touch Michael and minister to his family, Lord. Bring peace and comfort as needed. Encourage their family, Lord, to simply look to you. And God, we pray you would continue to touch his mother, Diana. God, minister to her in a very special way. And Lord, we thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, as we have as we drive around to and from appointments, Sharon often says, look at the tree. Look at that trunk. Look at the tree. And I've noticed something in looking at the trees. Almost all of them are reaching up to heaven. And God spoke to my heart this week and he said, think of the fact that their arms are all reaching up. It's a it's a message of praise. And I think we need to do that. So, Betty, will you come and lead us in music and worship and praise to the Lord? Good morning, everybody. We are our traveling group this morning. Uh, we couldn't stay in the ballroom, so we moved to the gazebo. And I'm sure a lot of you know this place and have come to enjoy the ducks and the geese and they're right behind us if you care to take a look <laughs> anyway the fountain's there so we're going to start out our service with there is sunshine in my soul there is sunshine in
There is no night, for in his light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home wherever you may roam. There's no power that can conquer you while God is on your side. Just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. My message this morning is entitled, Will is in Effect. In 1906, a covered wagon lumbered from Valentine, Nebraska, across the South Dakota border, headed for a little town about 40 miles north called Midland. And just 12 miles north and east of Midland, that little old covered wagon stopped. And out of it spilled a, a mother, a father, and four children. They had never seen this little hill or the ground before. They had simply made a claim on six sections of ground. They got busy and dad built a Saudi. You know, it was big enough for mom and dad and four kids, but when it got to six children, he decided he needed to build a frame house. He built a frame house, and about four years after the frame house was built, it burned to the ground. Now they're all back in the Saudi until he built another home. Fast forward to 2005, the last remaining child of the Whistler family passed away. That, it, that opened the door for the will to be read. The will that originally was penned by the man they called Grandpa Whistler. See, he was Sharon's great-grandfather. And the will was opened and read. It was kind of an interesting event. And that really starts kind of where we are today. So as we begin this message, I want to first of all thank Betty for leading us to the very throne room of God. I want to thank Vasco for singing one of my very favorite songs. A song that every time I hear it speaks to my heart. So Father, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts in this message today. Stir my heart and our hearts, O oh God, I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles or your iPads or your phones or whatever, please turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Beginning of the verse 11, the Bible says, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. 
not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and calves and ashes of ever sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purity of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of, tra of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive promise of the eternal inheritance. For the, for the <coughs> For where there is a testament or will, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator or the writer of the will. For the testament is, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since there is no power at all while a testator lives. Now I'm going to stop right there for now. You see, the will is just a piece of paper until the writer of the will dies. It's a useless. And as in great grandpa Whistler's will, it had no effect until Mary passed away. Then it became effective. You see, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth for you. He had you in mind when he created everything. He made it just so you and I could enjoy it, so we could have a personal, in-depth relationship with him. Yes, man fell. But man fell because God gave us, when he created us, the freedom to choose. He gave us that freedom to say, I want to follow Christ, or I want to do it my way. And all too often, when given that kind of a choice, we say, I want to do it my way. And you know, God in his love for us allows us to do it our way. You know, see, we, we, we quite often look at, at, the, at the Ten Commandments in, Gen in Exodus, the 20th chapter. But we forget that really... The Ten Commandments are ten principles that are put into practice will provide practical guidelines to live by leading to love, acceptance, forgiveness, and personal peace. But you see, we, we see their commandments, which we see they're the law. So we chafe against the law. You see, for a will to go into effect, the writer of the will has to die. And for the will to go into effect, there has to be proof that the writer of the will is dead. Interestingly, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19 all record the death of Jesus Christ. All of them have some things in common. They record the place. They record the time of death. They record uh, the last words that were spoken. And they record also the going to Pilate to confirm he is dead. You see, he had to, he had to, they had to go to Pilate to have the, the authority, the clearance to bury Jesus. Without those four elements, he would, he would have been dead, but he would, could not have been buried. So all those elements have to be in place for the will to be read and for the will to be uh, brought to maturity. See, at the, at the point of the certification of his death, the will becomes effective. And, uh, and, it, and then at that point in time, it establishes who the beneficiaries are, who is included in the will, and at times, they must prove who they are, and they must prove their connection to the deceased. I find that incredibly 
interesting in that how do you get to be a part of that inheritance? It's only through the, li through the death of the one who sealed the will, and it's through a personal relationship with him. The word says that as many as be received him, to them he gave the privilege or the right to be called sons of God. We have to be born again, born not of this flesh, but born of the Spirit. And Jesus told, Nic told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again, born not of the flesh, but born of the Spirit. As Christ followers, and Pastor Jim mentioned this a few weeks ago, as Christ followers, we receive the spirit of adoption into his family. <clears throat> and it's interesting, the adoption thing is somewhat interesting, somewhat close to my heart, is on December 5th, 1965, Sharon was at work and she received a phone call. The phone call identified themselves that we are Virginia Mason Hospital and we're calling you because we have a baby boy born yesterday and it says on his crib, baby boy Macintosh. That set into, into, uh, a, cha into a bunch of events that caused panic in our house, frankly. We, Sharon had written a letter six weeks earlier and said we would be interested in adopting a baby. And all of a sudden we get this phone call. We weren't ready. So we did a bunch of silly stuff like go out and buy a crib and put it in the living room and all that type of stuff. And a few days later we drove to Seattle. I had to ask my father to borrow his car because my car wouldn't make it. We drove to Seattle from Chehalis, Washington. And I'll never forget. I, I wish I would have had cameras then. I would have loved to have, saw, to have pictured that young lady who had been told she'd never have children go over to that crib, bent over, and pick up that little baby and hold it to her chest. Then she took him over, laid him on a dressing table, and she put on him that what she had bought for that little guy that we're home. See, he was ours. In adoption, in biblical times, the child became theirs and they could not change their mind. He was theirs. They were responsible for him. And he said, we receive the spirit of adoption. In adoption, the child is simply embraced in love. Many times the child doesn't have that kind of a choice, but for us as adults, we got to choose to walk with Christ. They adopt us. He got adopt us into his family. He put his arms around us and said, you are mine. Hallelujah. That's shouting ground, folks. How does one enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? I think sometimes we make it far too difficult. It's simply saying, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. That's all it is. Come in today, come in to stay, and at that point in time, the adoption process is cemented. And God takes us and draws us to himself and calls us, son or daughter. We prove our relationship with the Father. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, I better go to it so I don't mess it up. It says, and I've, I memorized this many years ago, but if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that I just messed it up, didn't I? that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes to righteousness, and with his mouth confession is made to salvation. It's that simple. So that's the, the, the proof of the will is in the death of the testator, the death of the one writing the will. The proof of the will is in the death of Jesus Christ. What are the provisions of the will? First one is the promise 
of eternal life in 1 John 2, 25. It says that's the promise, the promise of eternal life. The other provisions of the will are, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I will be with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am the God who brings healing. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am your strength and your redeemer. My right hand will hold you. And I love Zephaniah 3.17. He says that he rejoices over you with singing. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I will wake up and I will hear to my left the still voice, soft voice I should say, of the bride of my life singing an old, old song. Sometimes I lay there quietly and listen. And sometimes I'll feel a hand in the middle of my back. And sense the mighty presence of God. He says he will never leave us. Sometimes he speaks to us in ways that we don't necessarily hear at the time. The provision of the will. So what is the promise of the will? The promise of the will in 1 John 2.25, he says it's the promise of the will is eternal life. The promise of the will that he will be with us always. The promise of the will, he says, that he will be our burden bearer. The promise of the will is, in, in Psalms 23, that he will be with us. He is our provision. He is our power, our protection. And John, and Jesus said in John, the 14th chapter, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. The promise of your eternal residence. I enjoy picking up flyers on houses. I enjoy picking up the paper with all these houses listed, some of them in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and into millions. And I'd like to look at them. Not that I want one, but I know when I look at it, my eternal home makes those pale in significance. He says, I go and prepare a place for you. We have an eternal home. But he doesn't stop there. He says that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there may you may be also. The promise is he's coming back again. In Acts, the first chapter, about verse 9, the uh, disciples have been out, and Jesus has talked to them, and then he disappears, and the two angels come up here, and they say to the disciples, where are you standing, gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus so shall come again in like manner. He's promised that he will come back for those who are looking for him. That's his promise to us. That's the promise of the will. There's one other thing in the will that I want to touch on somewhat briefly. The power of the will. See, the power of the will gives you and me power of attorney to act on his behalf. Jesus said to the disciples after he had been crucified, before he ascended, he says to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. We are set out in the power and authority of his name to do what he's called us to do. And well, that's not too bad a deal because we're acting on the authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Teaching people the Word. Sometimes, most of the time, 
through lifestyle, living the manner that God taught us, taught us to live. At other times, he asked us to use words. And John said that something that we seldom hear it said this way, but it's the power of attorney to you and me. He said to, to us, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also. That's almost a scary statement because God may ask us to go someplace, do something that he's called us to do. He may, have call, may call you to a foreign field and some are listening to this who have probably been there. And God called you there to go there as his, in his power and his authority to proclaim the word of God to a foreign nation. Remember this. He who God calls, he equips and enables. He doesn't send you out empty. He sends you out full that you might serve in his power and his authority to do his work and accomplish his will. You see, the proof of his death and his resurrection are well recorded in the pages of history. Through his death and resurrection, he made provision for a life giving us all that is needed to, com to live in complete victory even in the face of great adversity. He has promised to be with us and he provides us with the power that dunamis to live a life that has a transforming power and can affect and impact the lives of those we come in contact with. I want to ask myself, and I want to ask you, are we living the life to the fullest that God has called us to live? Are we willing to take the risk to be different to the world around us? Are we willing to stand in the face of adversity knowing that his hand is not short that it cannot reach, nor is his ear heavy that he will not hear, but knowing that he will walk with us through the adversity, no matter what may come. He's promised that. But he's provided us with the power and the strength to do it. I want to pray with us as we close this part of the service. And Betty's going to come and lead one of my favorite old songs, Redeemed, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. But Father, we just ask you the cement in our hearts, our lives, and our minds. The provisions, the promise, the power, and the proof of your will for us. God, we give you honor and glory. We thank you for it. Amen. Now we're going to close our service with Redeem, How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeem, How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeem. Join us today. 
We trust you have a great week, that God's blessing and mercy will go before you, and that some way, this week, each of us will impact another life for the kingdom of God. Thanks for coming. May God's